Thank you, Brother Ralph, for singing that song. You know, I heard that song a while back, and it just spoke to my heart about what my life should be. And we're going to talk about a follower of Jesus today. Hope you all got a bulletin with an outline in it. Outline doesn't cover everything, but it basically gives which you can actually fill in if you want to make some notes, it's up to you. But it talks about who is a disciple. And I, I want to remind you this morning of something that, that I get reminded of periodically by the Lord, and that is this. Whenever I deal with God's Word, I'm having an encounter with God. And whatever he says, I consider it a fork in the road or our path in terms of coming to a point where what God says, I have a choice or I have to make a choice in terms of going this way or going that way, depending on my choice of what he says to me. We have that ability to choose. And so today, I want to talk to you about a person that Jesus calls his disciple. It's a very straight up message, by the way, first and foremost, from Jesus. You know, we consider Jesus as uh, a lot of people consider him that meek and mild individual. Well, yes, certainly. Meekness, according to the Word of God, is strength under control. But don't forget, Jesus had all the power in the world and has all the power in the world. And yet there were times, and this is one of them that we're going to talk about, where he actually was very straight with people. And you know what? We need some straight up talk once in a while to get our attention. You might wonder, well, Mike, why did you want to name this message, Who is a Disciple? Why don't you talk about being a Christian? You know, if you ask most people if they're a follower of Jesus today, what do they say they are? I would say most people by far. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody say other than, I'm a Christian. Now that, is, by the way, biblically, is the same thing. It means the same thing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So they're synonymous in Scripture. However, I believe that our world, who, by the way, in Acts chapter 11, called the disciples Christians in Antioch. You see, it wasn't a term that people in that day took upon themselves and called themselves Christians. You know what they called themselves? Disciples, followers of the way, people that truly committed their life to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord because of who He was and who He is and what He offered, and they received that offer or that call on their life and chose to follow Him and receive what Jesus offered, which was the gift of eternal life and still is. So when we talk about Christians today, the Bible, as I said, equates a Christian to a disciple. Both are followers, another name for a follower of Jesus. But our world today, if you were to ask some people today, and they would say they are a Christian, some would say that because Maybe they go to church on Sunday. It happens to be maybe a, what's called a Christian church. 
Some people would say, yes, I'm a Christian because I got baptized. Some people would say, yeah, my mom and dad, my grandmother, they were Christians, and I was raised in a Christian home, so I'm a Christian. Some people would say, well, I'm not of another faith. I don't, I'm not a part of the Jewish faith. I'm not a part of, of the Muslim faith or any other major religion of the world that you want to name. So I'm a Christian. It's almost like when we call about default. Well, I'm not any of those, so I must be a Christian. And so people use that term in a much broader way today, I think more than ever, than what it was used in Scripture. And so I chose to use the term disciple today because, by the way, Jesus called every one of his followers, every one of them, disciples. So we need to understand, I guess, if we talk about being a disciple, what Jesus says about who is a disciple or a follower of His. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. This is a very, as I said, very straight up, very a message that some people really say, wow, what does this all mean? Does he really mean what he says here? Jesus always means what he says in Scripture because it's all truth. We just need to understand it. So if you would turn in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 14. And I'm going to read four verses, please. And if you would, please, out of respect and honor to our Lord and His Word, I would, I would ask you to stand as I read these verses. Let us see what Jesus requires in terms of being His disciple. Luke chapter 14, verses, starting at verse 25, says, And there went great multitudes with him, meaning Jesus. And he turned and said unto them, If any man, and that word man's italicized, which really means if any man or woman, come to me or chooses to follow me. Here's what he says, first thing. And he hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, brothers and sisters, yea, or yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Second thing he says, verse 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And the third thing he requires is verse 33. Turning over to 33, it says, So likewise, whosoever he is of you that forsaketh not All that he has or hath cannot be my disciple. Please be seated. We deal with some very straight up talk, which we need to understand directly from our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord loves everybody. He loves every one of us here this morning. That's why He went to the cross to die for you and for me. 
And when Jesus called people in Scripture, he called Matthew 4, he called uh, Peter and his brother Andrew. He also called John and his brother James. They were all fishermen, by the way. And he said, follow me. And he told them, I will make you fishers of men, which means that they were all fishermen, but now I'm going to teach you how to touch people's lives for me if you follow me. They chose to follow him. Matthew, a publican, which we would call an IRS agent today, not very well liked by people then and today. Jesus said, follow me. Simply follow me. And he got up and followed Jesus. He made a choice, followed Jesus. So here we have, starting in verse 25, a verse that says, And there went great multitudes with him. And I want to stop there a minute. Now, there was a lot of people that were supposedly following Jesus. Why did they do that? Well, different reasons, I think. Some, I think, wanted to just see this man that nobody else could ever do what he did. He always spoke truth. He always knew everything. He, he, did, he, had, he performed all these miracles of healing people, raising people even from the dead. He could do all this stuff. Can you imagine if you had a man walking around today? I wonder if there would be people following him around. I think so. Not necessarily to follow him as Lord and Savior, but just to see, wow, who is this guy? And look what he can do. So there was great multitudes, many, many people following him. Now, most men today, I would think, would be very happy about that. Wow, look at all these people following me. They must look up to me. They must respect me. They, may, they must want to hear what I have to say. Most men would do that. Jesus. Because here's what he did. And he turned and said unto them. You know that word... And the Greek means that he turned suddenly. He turned suddenly. In other words, they were behind him, following him. He's walking, and all of a sudden, he turns around face to face, face to face, and tells them something that he said they needed to hear. They chose to follow him. And by the way, I would ask you, sitting here this morning, you are hearing a message that God, Jesus himself, gave to people that day, but he's also giving it to you and me right now. So I would ask you to place yourself in that word, multitudes. I guess, is that me? I would ask you to put yourself in the place and right amongst these people to hear this message. It's very important, very important that all of us understand what Jesus is saying if you want to be his follower or his disciple or if you want to use the word Christian, but from a biblical viewpoint, not from what most people use it today. He said unto them, if, verse 26, if any, and I will leave out the italicized man, not because it distorts at all the truth of this verse, but I want everybody to fit into this and hear what Jesus has to say to all of us. If any come to me, in other words, if any choose, to come and follow me. Here's the first requirement. And hate not his father 
and mother and wife and children and brethren or brothers and sisters, yea, or yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. That's pretty straight up language, Jesus. Do you really mean that I must hate everybody that I dearly love in this this life, my family, and including my own life? Do you literally mean that I must hate them? Well, when we understand Scripture, we must always understand the interpretation of Scripture rests upon not just isolating a verse like this, but also seeing how it fits with the rest of what Jesus teaches in His Holy Word. And when Jesus teaches me in Ephesians chapter 5 that I am to love my wife as Christ loved the church, then He can't possibly mean to hate my wife. He teaches me that I should honor my mother and my father. And even when they're gone, to honor the memory of them and who they were in my life and to love them, then it can't mean that I must hate them. When it teaches me that I should teach my children and love my children and show them the love of Christ, and teach them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How does that fit with this scripture when it says, hate my children? And also, the life that Christ has given me, which is precious and important and made in His image. I am to hate that life? No. So what does it mean? Here's what it means. And it's explained in Matthew, by the way, where the same passage of Scripture is and given. In Matthew, it says that if you do not love your father or your mother or your wife or your children, if you love them more than me, you are not worthy of me. So what Jesus is teaching is here, which really lines up with Scripture. Remember when that lawyer or that scribe came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, he was testing him, by the way, Jesus, what is the first and foremost and most important commandment? And Jesus said, and he referenced the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy strength and all thy might and all thy heart, and then you will should love your neighbor or others as yourself. So what Jesus is teaching here is such a supreme and high love for him that it almost seems like hating other people. It's not, but what He wants and demands, if you want to follow Jesus, is to love Him with your entire being because of who He is. And He he is to be first in that devotion and love above everybody that you love, everybody that you naturally love. He is to be first in your life. Second thing He teaches And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus saying here? Well, we understand the cross of Jesus, do we not? I mean, everybody must understand that if you really want to be right with God, you must believe in who Jesus is and what he did for you on his cross at Calvary. And if you are willing to follow Jesus, what you are saying is, when He calls your life to follow Him, you believe that He is the one who died on the cross for your sins, 
and that the finished work of that perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one that could fulfill the law of God, paid that great price for you and me, and are you willing to follow him and say, yes, Lord, I want you to be my Savior, my Lord. And that's what it means to follow Jesus in terms of trusting him and receiving what he offers to you. But then what does that include? If he went to the cross for you and me, and he died that terrible death for you and me, because that's what the cross is all about, death, then what does it mean when he says, bear your cross? Now, that's not Jesus' cross, obviously, so what is it? Well, if he says, bear your cross, and cross means death, then what that means apparently is what he's saying to you and me. If you want to be his disciple, you must be willing to die to the old self. That self that is selfish. That self that is proud. That self that wants their own way. That self that anything that happens, they want to be in control. Everything about us, Jesus says, in your natural state has to die. You have to surrender it. You have to give it up. Because you know what? You're no longer in charge. When you ask the Lord of creation, the Lord Jesus, to save you from your sin and to be your Lord and your Savior, what you are saying is, Lord, I surrender. I give it all up. My pride, my selfishness, everything about me, my ego, everything about me must die, die to self and allow Him now to live in me as Lord of my life. So he says, come after me, cannot be my disciple. We must die to self. We must surrender. We must sacrifice. Say, this is it, Lord. You are the one now. It's all about you. It's not about me anymore. It's all about you. I live for you. I don't live for me anymore. If you want to be His disciple, this is Jesus' second requirement here in this passage. The third one says, So likewise, whosoever, in verse 33, he is of you that forsaketh, or forsakes not all that he has, cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? Well, that word forsake means basically to let it go in terms of priority in your life. This is talking about everything you have, all your wealth, all your property. Everything is important to you. Everything, he says. You must say, listen, you cannot place any of this before me. All these things that are important to you, your 401Ks, your IRAs, whatever you want to name, your home, your job, anything you want to name must be given up and say, Lord, I know you've given this all to me, but I'm willing to put it in its proper place and priority and importance in my life if you want to be His disciple. You know, the Bible says in Psalms that the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of His servants. So the Lord blesses us with everything that we have. And keep in mind that everything that we have is really His anyway. We kind of grip things, you know, in our lives. And, well, that's mine. Oh, let's remember who gave it to us. Don't grip things in your life. It's painful when you lose it, very painful. Allow it to be there. And if the Lord says, I gave it to you, and if I choose to take it, here it is, Lord. Here it is. 
So what is Jesus saying here in terms of being a disciple? Well, I believe he's making certain requirements without question on any person that chooses to follow Jesus. You know, when we hear the gospel and we hear about God loving us, which he does, dying for us, which he did, for our sin, and he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, which he did. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I mean, who doesn't want in their right mind to receive what God offers, the gift of eternal life? By receiving Christ, you receive and believe in what he did on his finished work of Jesus Christ. But you know what? I think we fail to remember that Jesus says, yes, I put a call on your life, and if you receive me as Lord and Savior, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. You must put me first above everybody. A love for me that greatly exceeds everybody that you love. You must die to that old self, Jesus says, that causes us even problems to this day because the flesh and the spirit wrestle, fight each other. Romans 7, Galatians talks about that. Spirit lusts us against the flesh. I mean, there's a war going on with inside of anybody that's truly saved because now you have a divine nature and the old nature still fights, still rears its ugly head. And the only way to get victory in your life is to surrender everything you are to Jesus and to fit this mold of what he requires of you to be his disciple or follower. And the third thing is everything that you have, all your wealth, everything that you possess, you must say, Lord, I know you gave it to me and I'm so thankful and I want to manage it well. I want to be a good steward. That's what a manager is. But Lord, I'm not going to grip it because my faith and my trust is in you, not in what I have. My security is not in my bank account. It's not in my investments. My security, because those all may change, my security is in Jesus. And that's where it has to be for you and me. So let's sum this up. What is Jesus saying? Not saying anything about earning your salvation, obviously. We know that very clearly. What is he saying? When he calls a person to follow him, he expects them to meet this deal. He expects them to realize when you follow Jesus as your Savior and you trust in Him as your Lord and Savior, you are receiving what He offers, the gift of eternal life based on what He did. Everything, your salvation that He did is based upon what He did on the finished work of the cross. It's all based on that. Nothing else. Nothing can be added to that as far as coming to Jesus and following Him. However, once you are a child of God, once you do call yourself a Christian or a disciple, what does that mean? How are we to live? We need to be reminded of that. Well, Jesus says, you've got to love me more than anybody. Do you? Do you love me more than your mom or your dad or your wife or your kids or your brothers or sisters? or even your own life? Do you love me more than that? Jesus says you have to to be my disciple, my follower. Have you died that old nature in terms of allowing that to rear its ugly head and control your life? Is now Jesus Lord of your life? Do you realize it's not you anymore? 
It's not your pride. It's not your ego. It's not your way anymore. It's His way. Have you surrendered that to Him in your life? Because that's what He requires. And how about all the stuff that you have? Stuff that's pretty valuable, maybe. Your money, your house, your investment, anything else. Name it. You name it. Anything that's important to you, you name it. Does that take control of your life so that that's what you think about in your life and that's what you're geared to in your life? Or do you live now as a disciple or as a follower of Jesus? Now do you live for Him? Remember, it's not about you anymore or me. It's about Him. I believe we need to be reminded of that. You know, He did this out of love for these people. You know what? Jesus sorted out the crowd here. He said, hey, wait a minute, guys. All you guys are following me. Multitude, I want to let you know, if you want to follow me, this is what it means. This is what it's all about. And He did it out of love for them because He didn't want them to superficially follow Him. You see, He wanted them to be real. He wanted them to be committed to Him. So when we talk about being a disciple or biblically a Christian, it's simply a follower of Jesus that has said, Lord, I want to be right with You. I will receive that call on my life to be saved from my sin because of what you did on the cross of Calvary for me. And I want to be your person. I want to make a difference in this world. And the only way to make a difference is to allow Jesus to live through you and me. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is this too hard when you think about what Jesus did for you? No. Without Jesus doing what he did for you, or me, we have no chance to be right with God. We're going to finish with a hymn I call it an invitation hymn. Because I believe everybody, as I said earlier, must deal with what God says to you and me. I must deal with it. You must deal with it. What's your choice? Fork in the road. Fork in the road. When you deal with the Word of God and Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, the one who revealed God, who He is, and all that He is, what are you going to do with it? We're going to sing a song called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Because I believe that God is speaking to some hearts here today. I mean, I think He's trying to speak to every heart here today. Are we listening? And what do we do about it? I'm going to ask you not only last time I asked people to stand right where they sat in the pew, if they truly wanted to live for Jesus, I'm going to ask you this morning to come forward with me and stand with me. If you're serious about your walk with Jesus and you want to be what Jesus says is his follower. I'm going to ask you to come stand with me today. Not necessarily to be saved, because most, I'm sure most of you are right with God. There's probably some here that maybe have not made a decision. If you haven't made a decision to receive Christ and to follow him, come. But you know what? In recent months in my own life, I want to share that God has been speaking to me about being a person that follows Him according to Scripture. I want to make that afresh in my life. If you want to say renew it, then use that term. But I'm going to ask you, if you want your life to be refreshed and a new view and a new way of walking with Jesus, not in the sense of another way, 
but in a sense of just making what you know already you are and what you need to do is to just say, Lord, I want to come forward. I want to stand with Mike, and I want to stand with him before him first and whoever's here and say, Lord, I want to be your disciple. And maybe I haven't always loved you like I should. Maybe I always haven't died to self like I should. Maybe I haven't always viewed my possessions as I should. But you know, today I'm saying, Lord, I want to renew that and my following of you today in my life. Are you willing to do that? I hope you are. If you do it, God will give you such a blessing and you cannot imagine. And it's not me, it's not Mike. It's Jesus. Are you willing to do that today? Anytime we take a public stand for Jesus, he richly blesses it. I know he does. Based on his holy word and what I've experienced in my life, which fits in to the word of God. So we're going to sing today. I have decided to follow Jesus, not only for those that maybe want to get right with God today, but for those that say, Lord, I want my life to count. I want my life to to truly be what you want it to be for your glory, your honor. And in the process of that, God will richly bless you. Are you willing to do that today? I ask you to come and stand with me today. Let's sing together.